Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyegolu. Now here's a fascinating story because when Pope Francis holds a conference called Liberating Mary from the Mafia, it's a bit of an admission that there is a problem. There are historic links between organized crime and the venerating cult of the Virgin Mary, traditionally the intercessor between Christ and fallible humans, so there's obviously a bit of an issue here. The Pope thinks that the Virgin Mary is being exploited by the Mafia for their own illicit ends, and he's launched a new Vatican group to fight the mobsters, as well as a conference titled Liberating Mary from the Mafia. The Catholic Church in Italy has long been associated with the Mafia, thanks in part to their post-war common cause against communism. While some Catholic priests have courageously opposed the mob and paid for it with their lives, others have been called to explain their celebration of funerals, weddings and other sacraments for Mafia dons, as well as acceptance of their donations and participation in their religious processions. Extraordinary, isn't it? Well, for more on this, I'm joined now from the UK by Brendan Thompson, who is the CEO of Catholic Voices, the media arm of the official Catholic Church. Brendan, great to see you again, and thank you very much indeed for joining us. I mean, I have to say, I don't know what your perspective is on this, because you're obviously on the inside. I mean, it's an absolutely fascinating story, and uh, it kind of brings up this image of the pontiff ranged against a major criminal organization in Italy. Yeah, as a, as a Catholic, I'm very impressed by the comments that the, the Pope is making. He's been very, very strong, and he has been strong for a number of years. In 2014, when he was visiting Sicilian families who had been killed by the mafia, by the so-called Cosa Nostra um, mafia bosses, um, he said, blood soaked money, blood soaked power, these things you can't take with you to the next life, repent. So very stark words from the Pope and he's continuing that with this with this conference as you say, um, working in a multidisciplinary way with civic leaders, with criminologists and theologians in order to, to fight and, and combat this, this kind of scourge of the mafiosi. You can't believe in God and be a mafiosi, Pope Francis says. Well, I will certainly agree with the pontiff there. There seems to be a fundamental contradiction in it. Um, but I understand that, I mean, just looking at what actually happened and what's triggered all of this, you touched a bit on the killing of priests and that sort of thing. I understand there are processions that apparently carry the statue of the Virgin Mary, and the whole path of this procession is designed so that the statue stops and bows in front of the homes of mafia bosses. And apparently it has nothing to do with religion, but it's about control. I mean, tell us more about that. This is a curious feature of, of Catholic cultures. I think it's hard to understand if you're not part of a Catholic culture, but the, the Pope is Latin American, I'm South American, and you see often images of Our Lady tattooed onto to gangsters. So there has been this association, and in a world where we're more conscious, I guess, of cultural appropriation, the, the Pope is rightly framing this as religious appropriation. And so there are these very curious events, as you say, where as part of a procession, where they process with a statue of Mary, they would stop by a mobster's house and kind of give a little nod to it. So I think some of these things are unspoken parts of Catholic culture, a kind of weird way in which there's an overlap between Catholicism and crime. And I think the Pope is holding a mirror up to that. He's holding up a mirror to say, to the hypocrisy to say that this is no longer this is no longer needed this is no longer good um, it was never good and many of the popes starting with john paul ii uh, right back in 1993 has changed the church's relationship with the mafia so this just continues that and i'm glad to see it's kind of leading to some concrete action taking place well i mean just, just to be clear that uh, as you said those of us on the outside or, or people on the outside i mean actually understand this i mean the idea is that if you know the mafia can convince the local people i mean the local priest and hundreds of people to stop in front of their homes um, that they're demonstrating that they control the community is that is that a way to see it 
Yeah, absolutely. And so I think the Pope's comments, in a way, he's painting a, a target on himself for the mafia there. There has been some suggestion that, you know, there was anti-Francis, anti-Pope Francis graffiti in the streets of Rome, and there was links to mafia. To what extent that's true, I don't know. But it does go to show that, you know, the mafia for many of us seems like something from the films. But for in some parts of Italy, they still hold, you know, great influence. And so the fact that there is this connection with faith, I think places Pope Francis and places the church in a unique place to to speak truth to power, you know, to this kind of criminal power. So he's been very clear in, in saying and in carrying on from Pope John Paul II before him that you are excommunicated if you are mafiosi. So it's a call to conversion, a call to say, uh, you know, enough is enough and to try and question these these links and these powers and allow ordinary people to see this hypocrisy as well to give courage to them as, as the church is trying to be courageous itself and of course what must be worrying for people like yourself i mean the faithful the pope and all the rest of it is is i mean that in a sense by doing what these uh, local priests and the community do it, it also suggests that the mafia is controlling the church as well, doesn't it? I mean, to that extent, I can understand why the Pope would be outraged by all of this. I mean, is this something that he's paid attention to before? I mean, have there been cases that have come up to his attention that, you know, he's finally decided that something has to be done, enough is enough, and there are, you know, quite a number of these cases now? Sure. In 1993, there was a, um, a priest called Father Lino Puglisi who was murdered by the mafia on his doorstep. And he was very involved with young people in helping them to steer clear of the mafia. And so it just goes to show there there is a real danger in getting on the wrong side of the mafia. And so in 1993, I think angered by this, uh, John Paul II, he had this prepared speech that he was making in Sicily. And he just, he went off script and he said, in the name of Christ, this is not good enough. Now, if I call you to convert. And so Pope Francis in 2014, when he was visiting, um, it, it, Pope Benedict actually made uh, Father Puglisi a blessed on his way to becoming a saint, which goes to show, you know, this is a priority for the church. And Pope Francis has continued that in 2014 when he visited those families who have suffered, uh, who have been killed because of the mafia, and also to underline the life of Puglisi, that he's a kind of model for what the church should be doing. It should be offering a chance for people not to be involved with the mafiosi, but also as a as an influence. So the church has a has a duty, I would say, uh, you know, because it's offensive the way that you know, as a Catholic, I find it deeply offensive the way that it, it's used. And so this is is it encouraging. The conference that's coming uh, is going to be a yearly conference to show what the work of the department is is doing to to kind of this anti mafia task force. So it'd be interesting to see how they work collaboratively over different disciplines to try and bring an end to this. And I mean, the the um, the, the the Pope, uh, you know, comes from a background, doesn't he? That that, as you mentioned earlier, that was very close to liberation theology, um, which is you know very prevalent, or at least was at one point in Latin America. So his language appears to suggest liberation for the Virgin Ma Ma Mary for uh, from the corruption of the mafia, doesn't it? So yeah, and it's been echoed by the, the head of the department that's helping to put together this task force, who said, this isn't religious, this is superstitious. Um, and so there has to be a distinction between uh, theology on the one hand and what this is, which is religious appropriation. It's using images um, in, an, in a deeply offensive way. And so Francis is right, I think, in this crusade to, as he says, free the Virgin Mary from this kind of religious idolatry. Um, so it's a weird kind of curiosity of, of Catholic culture, but I think in many ways, over many cultures, we see how religion is used um, in these kind of power plays. You know, religion can be a, a convenient scapegoat for some, and for others it can be, as in the case of the Mafia, a kind of veneer, a religious veneer, or a, a ploy or a plot to control people. So I think any way of using religion, positively or negatively, as a kind of power play, I think this is a rejection of that. Well, I mean, I can see how a reformist pope would want to reform this. I mean, is he, though, giving individual support to priests and nuns who've tried to take on the issue before? Because, I mean, surely he can't be the first person who's scandalized by the Virgin Mary being hijacked by criminals. Sure. So I think highly 
lighting a figure like Father Pugliese is a way of, of kind of giving credence, of giving um, a platform to those people who want to, to work. So, you know, the church is also saying that it's open to working with other competent civil authorities, so legislators, criminologists, through this anti-mafia task force. So it's saying that the church doesn't want to, to work on this alone, it wants to work with others. So it remains to be seen how, what practical outcomes will come from the results of this collaboration. But I think it's a, it's a kind of very exciting development. So it means that it's not only being preached from the pulpit, it's also there's, there's practical action and practical application. So I think that this is, a, this is a story with legs to it. We'll see what happens in the years to come. Well, I know you touched on this briefly when you talked about idolatry, but I mean, I'm not to go into sort of doctrinal issues, but I mean, you know, some would say that sort of walking around with a statue of the Virgin Mary, I mean, as a representation of, of somebody who is, uh, you know, deified and, and who lived like a long time ago and is, you know, seen as the mother of Jesus Christ as a form of idolatry. Sure. I mean, in the Old Testament, um, idolatry is, is explicitly condemned, but also in the book of Exodus, many kind of few chapters later, we see that the Ark of the Covenant is asked to be adorned with statues. So it's not statues that are prohibited and so the statues of the Virgin Mary are not worshipped in a certain sense. They're meant to be, a, you know, an analogy could be a pointing finger. You don't look at the finger that's pointing, you look at what it points to, it points beyond itself. And so Marian uh, theology, so talking about Mary, always leads to her son. Her last re recorded words of the gospel were, do whatever he tells you at the wedding feast of Cana. So that sums up what the authentic Catholic kind of teaching around statues of Mary. It's not worship, it's not idolatry, it's, it's use of religious images, which can be a really beautiful aid to prayer. Well, uh, I think, uh, okay, we'll agree on that one for the moment. But Pope Francis is, is a bit of a first, though, isn't he, Brendan, in acknowledging the work of priests on the streets in southern Italy against the mafia? Because I understand that until recently, uh, a lot of these street priests were not really welcome in the Vatican. I mean, are you able to shed some light on that and, and uh, how Pope Francis has apparently changed things? So it's certainly true to say that Francis, in the various reforms he's been trying to do since being Pope, has wanted a cultural change uh, within the Vatican. So you often see him in, in various of his priorities. So, you know, making sure that there's places for refugees to come and stay within the walls of the Vatican. He often will just go out and call somebody, call people directly. You know, he'll have the homeless coming, living in the Vatican. So it's no surprise that, as you say, when it comes to this issue as well, which is obviously um, important now in the pontificate of Francis, that he wants to change the, the way things are accessed, that the church isn't just this kind of distant institution, that actually it's, it's practical, it's with the people. And certainly Francis as a Latin American pope is a very different style to other popes. You know, I know as a Latin American, you know, Latin Americans be very, very chatty, off the cuff. He, he's a very gifted communicator. And so when it comes to trying to change this culture, um, certainly when he comes to trying to support and vindicate people, he doesn't mind, you know, reaching out to the individual, so to speak, to kind of give individual support, which he clearly has in this case as well. And, and uh, being in the UK where you are, I mean, predominantly a Protestant country, I mean, do you feel a bit remote from things? I mean, you know, we've got about 30 seconds before we have to take a break. Yeah, we're a small dynamic minority, about, you know, eight to nine percent of the, the UK population. So they, we have different challenges here than they have, where I don't think we have the mafia in quite the same way. But, you know, this is one of the hubs for human trafficking in this country. And the church in the UK meets the needs of people who have been trafficked and working with civil authorities. So it's encouraging that the church, wherever it is, is true to its social teaching and reaches out to those, whatever needs it finds. So those are the needs in this country and they're the needs in Italy fighting the mafiosi. OK, uh, please stay with us, Brendan, because I want to talk with you a bit more. This is a fascinating conversation. You're watching The Arise interview, plenty more still ahead, as Pope Francis takes aim at the Italian mafia over the use of the image of the Virgin Mary. Stay with us. 
Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Onyekulu. Now, as you might have heard, Pope Francis and the Vatican are fighting to free the Virgin Mary from the Mafia. The Catholic pontiff is backing a drive to end what he calls the deviant spirituality of Italian crime families who use the Madonna as a shield of religious respectability. Early in his papacy, Pope Francis responded to a particularly gruesome double murder in Calabria by traveling to the region and issuing a ringing condemnation of the local mafia organization responsible, saying that they represent the adoration of evil and contempt of the common good and proceeding to excommunicate them from the Catholic Church. The following month, with the Pope back in Rome, an officially sanctioned religious procession through the streets of a Calabrian town halted outside the home of Giuseppe Mazzagati, a local mafia boss. There, a giant statue of the Virgin Mary was made to bow in homage and obedience to Mazzagati. That was partly what has outraged the Pope, who is now determined to free the Virgin Mary from the mafia. And Brendan Thompson, CEO of Catholic Voices, the media arm of the official Catholic Church, is still with me from the UK. Thank you very much indeed for staying with, with us. Um, and we're just talking about some of the priests that have attempted to take on the mafia um, in the past. Uh, what, what has happened to those priests? And uh, what sort of campaign were they leading? Mm. So the, the, the most prominent case, the case we've already kind of alluded to, was Father Lino Puglisi. So on the 15th of October 1993, he was murdered on the doorstep of his house. Um, and this was principally because of the work he did in trying to help the young people of, of Sicily to stay away from the Mafia. So there's a very famous crime family in Sicily called the Cosa Nostra. And clearly they didn't take too kindly to the work of Puglisi. And Puglisi is a who was made, um, was, was declared a martyr uh, by Pope Benedict in, in about 2012 and also declared a blessed. So this means he's on his way to, to being a saint. So there's a canonization in a certain sense of, of this issue. And you can see through the comments that are being made by the Pope that this is important. Not only do we want to kind of spiritually honor the, the legacy of people like Father Puglisi, we want to kind of give spiritual resources and practical resources uh, to rooting out a kind of system substructures of, of the mafiosi culture that exists in, in Italy through the anti-mafia task force. Well, yes, I mean, having the Pope on their side, I mean, what difference is that going to make? Uh, I understand it's actually quite dangerous for Catholic leaders to speak publicly against the mafia in southern Italy. Um, as you said, some of them have actually been killed. Sure, and even assassination attempts against popes aren't, aren't entirely unknown. We think of the assassination attempt against the life of John Paul II um, in the 80s. And so I have said before, and I think it's true, that Pope Francis is, in a sense, painting a target. And um, there's an ambiguous relationship between, as, as has already been mentioned, between the Mafia and the Church. You know, it's hard to say, you know, how much the, the Mafia and the Church are interrelated without kind of going into speculation. But it's certainly true to say that I think that the work of this this anti-mafia task force really is to kind of call into question those elements of culture that have otherwise just become normalized. So it's disgusting, frankly, that this this statue, you know, a statue that is revered by many, that is a is a sign of, of love and fidelity of, of the Virgin Mary, um, becomes subject to these power plays. And so religion, I think, and, and Pope Francis has spoken elsewhere about religion being used in this way. And the Pope is a, is a pivotal world figure. You know, he's, he's a broker of peace and the Vatican in many ways, in, in kind of, in obvious ways, but also in undercurrent ways is involved in, in helping to shape world, world politics still. So Pope Francis is an influential leader. And so the Mafia have quite an enemy on their hands. Well, I mean, you, you touched on an interesting point there when you when you talked about, I think, the re the relationship between sort of the, the church and, and the mafia. Because looking at a bit of church history and the legacy of sort of Marian devotions, I mean, there was, at the end of the Second World War, I, I believe, an attempt to build such devotions in an anti-communist fashion in southern Italy. I mean, the Virgin Mary as a sort of shield against communism. It was also a shield against feminism. I mean, women's rights, etc. So, in a sense, the Pope is 
reclaiming the Virgin Mary as a force for social change. Sure, and I think that there's always this dynamic that religious images and religion as a whole can be weaponized um, um, against groups. And I think that that's a shame because Pope Francis himself has spoken about the need to involve uh, women in a deeper way in the kind of uh, decision making processes in, in the church at every level. Um, and so I think the, the Virgin Mary and also as we're talking about church history, you know, many, many pioneers of very, um, you know, various sciences that were women, like the first PhD in mathematics was awarded by a Catholic university with the approval of the Pope. And even in this country, there have been many, you know, saints and martyrs, women, there are four doctors of the church where women saints. So I think that this is, the Virgin Mary ought to be a symbol that is is encouraging for women and for it to be used in this way, I think kind of, it sullies the image in a certain sense. And so this this campaign, this crusade to free the Virgin Mary from this politicization from this weaponization, I think is an important one. Can there be excesses sometimes in some of the kind of Marian devotion that happens? Certainly, but I think that that ought to, you know, inauthentic worship is always replaced by authentic worship. And so part of the theological element of this anti-mafia task force, clearly religion is part of the picture. So it's important that it's part of the conversation. And I think it's part of restoring authentic Marian devotion, which I think is, is, good, is good for the church and the wider world. I was going to say, Brendan, um, that that's the way the Pope rolls. But I mean, the idea of the Pope rolling has left quite an image in my head. But I mean, he is that kind of Pope, isn't he? Without being or sounding sort of disrespectful to him. The, uh, the, one of the ways of reading Pope Francis is to see him um, as a parish priest. So like your local parish priest pa par excellence. So you can imagine going up to him and he has this charisma, this dynamism. He's very quotable, uh, you know, often he communicates in a way that's very, very simple. He talks about a, a grammar of simplicity, and by that he means a language that everyone can understand, and trying to make the faith accessible to all, and trying to challenge stereotypes about the church. And so I think he is very, very effective um, in that way. I'm reminded of the days when Latin America was really was fighting against what they saw as sort of domination and so on. And I mean, he is old enough to have been part of all of that. I mean, he, he was a priest in, in Latin America. You know, one remembers the, the likes of, you know, Nestor Paz and, you know, my life for my friends and, and you know, uh, Gustavo Gutierrez and, and all the rest of them who were really huge sort of giants um, in liberation theology in Latin America. And it would be fair to say that the Pope can easily stand shoulder to shoulder with those people. The Pope has had, you know, kind of first-hand experience of right-wing governments like the Peron government that he grew up under as a priest and as a provincial of the Jesuits, so the religious order in Argentina that he was a part of before coming Pope. So you can see this in the film, The Two Popes. It's, it's quite a good exposition of that time. I think it tells the, the story well. So he's he's very, very used to, to, to making these, these, these big proclamations. Um, Right, and, and just a, a final word uh, from you, um, Brendan, before we go. Just on that conference, uh, when is it starting? Uh, how, how long is it going to last? And what sort of action is the church actually going to take as a result of that conference? Sure, so the work of the department that is, is sorting together the anti-mafia task force is beginning now in September. And the idea is that they meet every year on the 13th of May to have an annual conference to de detail the work of the of the Department of the Anti-Mafia Task Force. So some of the work and the practicalities remains to be seen, but certainly what it is doing is it's beginning on a multidisciplinary approach. So it's theologians, it's criminologists, it's civic leaders, you know, civil authorities working together in order to find solutions to to, to uproot some of the, the, the cultural elements, but also the kind of practical criminal elements of, of the mafia in Italian society. Brendan, I want to thank you very much indeed for the time you've taken to talk to us. Brendan Thompson is the CEO of Catholic Voices, which is the media arm of the official Catholic Church. 
That's it for this edition of The Arise Interview. Do join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja and the UK. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.